So here's how I get my string orchestra students to play really in tune. So just like you, I'm really sensitive to playing in tune, uh, both as a musician and as an orchestra teacher. It's an important part of the job, right? Now, I, over the course of my career, have taught middle school, high school, orchestra, uh, very successfully throughout my career. And one of the questions I get all the time, both on the channel and in person, is how do I get my orchestras to play so in tune? I wanna give you some real strategies, and I will tell you these strategies are not the only way to do it. There are a lot of great strategies out there. This is just my way of doing it, and I hope it helps you. I encourage you to check out my website at Joel Powell Conductor, J O E L P O W E L L Conductor.com for more resources. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions whatsoever. First things first, let's talk about tuning the instrument. When you are teaching beginning students specifically, whatever grade that might be for you, for me, I am tuning those instruments every single day, and I'm just doing a simple pluck tune. I'm gonna have a sustained A going, I'm gonna have my tuner, maybe it's tonal energy or whatever app you use to tune to, but a sustained A, and I'm gonna keep checking all of the strings every single day. And one thing you can do is even as the class is starting, if, it's, if you're on a bell schedule, for instance, as that first class is coming in, chances are you have a lot of kids in that group, have them start standing in a line, forming a line in the front of the class. And you can just tune even just the important strings that you need to tune for that day. At the beginning of the year, oftentimes for beginning string pedagogy, we're just tuning the A string and the D string. So if nothing else, just make sure those are really, really well in tune. Because if that's not your starting point, if perfectly in tune strings aren't the starting point, how in the world are the students going to learn to put their fingers in the right place if it's moving around constantly on them. They need something concrete. And as much of a pain as it is, you've got to tune those strings every day. So develop fast procedures where you can do that. Let's talk about those little digital tuners while we're at it. They're great tools to use, no doubt, having that technology for kids to tune to. And I know for a lot of us, we go, there's one of me, there are a gazillion kids in my classroom. This digital tuner is gonna be a fast way for them to check their tuning. Ah, but there's a problem with that in my opinion. They become over dependent on that if it's the only informing source of tuning that they're using. It's a great tool, but if it's the only source of direction that they're getting, I'm not a big fan. So personally, again, with huge classes that I've had in the past, 60, 70, 80, even pushing 100 students, I'm tuning every instrument every day, and I'm doing that really, if we're in a four quarter system, I'm tuning it for the first semester, and for a good portion of the second semester as well, I'm tuning their instruments for them, and then in the last quarter, so the first three quarters I tune, and in the last quarter, I'm roughly having them tune, if I'm seeing them close to every day, or you know, every week, um, a few times every week, Usually by the time we get to that last quarter becomes a time where they can tune because they, they've really started to learn where the pitches are in their left hand and they have that absolutely confident baseline of in tune open strings to work from. When I'm checking tuning every day, even if it's just a quick pizzicato check, I have a tuner going and in this case it's Tonal Energy. I love this app, it's really helpful, but really any tuner or tuner app would do the job and I'm double and triple checking that's in tune. I get that A right, I got that D right, I've got my perfect fifth, I'm ready to move on, next student. Obviously, with beginning strings, the very first year you're checking them all the time, but with the more advanced groups, of course, they're gonna do the tuning on their own, right? They're gonna take care of that job on their own, and that's where the digital tuners are just fine as an extra confirmation, in my opinion, to use. Uh, but first, I'm going to always have my students check by ear and have them use that process of audiating and tuning using the drone sequence and using our tuning corrals first. 
because I want them to use their ear above all else. I want to strengthen their ear. And the tuner then is only used, the digital tuner is only used as a confirmation to make sure that they actually did get it in tune. When I do have my students tune their own instruments, we're doing it with the bow. I'm not a fan of pluck tuning because I think it's less accurate and you don't have a sustained pitch to tune from. So in my case, my violins, violas, uh, cellos and basses, I'm gonna give every single string on this tuning app, and this is tonal energy that I'm using. We're holding out the A. I would maybe start with my basses, have them start the note, then cellos layer them in, kind of like a tiramisu cake and then the violas, and then finally the violins, nice and softly. We're also playing quietly. We're playing very quietly. Because tuning is private. We don't want to share it with anyone else. If your neighbor can hear you, you're too loud. So we're out over the fingerboard, lane what I would call lane one or lane two, right near the fingerboard. And we're just holding that pitch and I tell them, change your bow as little as possible. I also have my violins and violas reaching up and over like this, or re up and under rather. And I have my cellos, um, generally speaking, moving their cello to the right side just temporarily. And again, this is much further in their playing process. So they've got great posture at this point, but I have them reaching over to check like so. And by reaching over the string, by flipping it, it allows them to keep the bow in the same hand and then allows them to reach their left hand over the bow and to adjust using fine tuners. If you have precision pegs on your school instruments or perfection pegs, sometimes they're called, I would highly recommend that because they're very helpful and it almost makes the peg like a mechanized tuner, kind of like the double bass, where then you can make small adjustments with that. And again, I don't let my violins or violas use their pegs right up front. First, it's just tuning with our fine tuners and if they have a peg problem, they bring it to me. And then later down the road, I'm gonna teach them how to use the pegs and we, we don't stigmatize breaking a string if that happens. I've got plenty of extras and I'm ready for that when I first teach them how to use the pegs as well. But because that is an important part of the process, right? We're testing it quietly so that we can really listen to the note rather than really loud. Am I in tune? We want them, as I said, to change the bow as little as possible. And this helps to encourage an environment where we can actually hear what we're doing because you try hearing over 70 other instrumentalists playing and sawing away at their instruments, right tuning your own instrument. Really hard to do, right? With my more advanced orchestras, for instance, this would a lot of times be with my, um, as my seventh grade orchestras get toward the end of the year or my eighth grade orchestras, I'm gonna use a tuning corral. And that would be at first, I would have like the bases as we're tuning, the double bases are layered in like a tiramisu cake. The bases would hold an A. Then the cello sustain that A. The violas hold that A the violins hold that A, and then the double basses then would be changing to a D, dropping down to a D as the other rest of the orchestra holds the A, and then the cellos change to a D while violins and violas are holding the A, and then the violas change to D, the violins change to D, and we just continue that sequence. Um, and what that's doing then in a big setting, you're having your students basically learn the tuning process by listening to the perfect fifths, and you can also put those notes on your tuner. So, I'll pretend to be a double bass for right now. I don't have a bass right here with me, but we'll pretend I'm a low double bass. Then we'd have the cellos come in, violas, and go ahead and play Madison if you would, your A. She keeps holding the A. She keeps holding the A out. And then I have the double bass changes to a D. a slight adjustment needed to be made. Listen to it out of tune. See my D's out of tune. I make it a little lower. Until it's really in tune. Then the other instruments change to a D one at a time. She would make her changes, which is her instrument's just fine right now. She keeps holding that. We're holding softly, nice and quietly. And then the double basses would change to the G. And here it was flat. Cellos then would also add in with their G, change from a D to a G. And everyone would eventually change to a G together. Good, yep, and she would make the changes. And we would keep going through that process. 
um, until we layer on every single instrument. Um, and then when I get to the bass E string, I put the rest of the orchestra back on an A and the bass is dropped down to a low E. And then the second violins go to an E, the first violins go to an E. And then basses, double basses, I give them a Q where they change back to an open A. Now it's important to notice I'm doing this, I'm not saying anything, it's just very quiet. This again is with a more advanced orchestra as you're continuing to build that intonation refinement. Having them tune their instruments really accurately, this is going to help. Because you're going to hear any string that's out of tune really well in, a, in that chorale setting. So let's talk about finger tapes on violin, viola, cello, and bass. A lot of different feelings on that. I feel very strongly that these are hugely important. To me, they're one of the biggest helps in what I do to get my students to play in tune. They won't get you all the way there, but they're going to make a huge difference because they take something that's really abstract and make it really concrete. So Think about the, important of visual, the importance of visualization. Have you ever had a hard time visualizing something and then you see a picture and you go, oh, got it. For our students, it's the same way. Finger tapes, when placed poorly, are the worst thing in the world. What's the point? They're just, you're just teaching them the wrong place to put it. But when they're in the right place, they're immensely helpful. And so before I ever see my orchestra that is planning to use the tapes, uh, I'm going to get those on their instrument, especially with beginners, but certainly other orchestras as well. And you can even have them leave it in the orchestra room and you go through and tape them up, get a trusted friend, uh, another orchestra director friend or a trusted high school student that you really trust with a great ear and a tuner to help you. Uh, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna perfectly tune every string and I'm gonna place the tapes down to the scent in tune and I'm gonna check it with a bow and I'm gonna check it with a tuner, specifically tonal energy in my case, generally using equal temperament to do that on the tuner. And that's gonna really help to have a solid baseline to work from because I know that they're gonna work. Now in my case, I use pinstriping tape and pinstriping tape is really cheap and it's available at every auto parts store. I wouldn't use electrical tape. That stuff gets sticky, it's awful. Ugh, please don't use that if you can avoid it. Pinstriping tape really is fantastic. And in my case, I really like the black finger tapes because they're not super obvious to the audience or to adjudicators or anyone else uh, observing. And, uh, but they're just enough of a help to the student. Student also doesn't overly rely on them by these really brightly colored or differently colored uh, tapes. Now I know different colored tapes or some, some teachers do use that as a teaching tool to refer to specific colors of tapes, but I just like the good old black finger tapes and I'm gonna put them on for whatever orchestra, high school, middle school that needs it. I teach high school now uh, pretty successfully. But I even have our orchestra sometimes. I'm gonna place a, a key tape or a few tapes here and there depending on the level of the orchestra and, and what we need. There's no shame in that, it's just an extra help. Until we don't need it anymore, then I'm gonna remove it as soon as possible. That brings me to the point of an exit strategy with your tapes. You want to have an exit strategy with tapes. And for me, um, the first tapes that are gonna come off ultimately are gonna be the second tape. I'm gonna take that second tape on the instrument second from the scroll that is off. Uh, next will come the first finger tape, that will come off later. And this is gonna be around the time that they're getting really good at extensions and playing naturals as well. Not just D major sequence or G major sequence, but this is gonna be into their, usually their second year at some point that those tapes are gonna come off. Maybe even toward the end of the second year playing. And as we start to learn third position, because then you see we have that third tape and the fourth tape that are all ready to go to help guide the students in third position and beyond, right? Here's the thing though. Tapes are so helpful in making intonation more obvious from a visual standpoint because think of how often we tell kids, all right, well, that's a low two on the D string in the case of F natural. Okay, well, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> we, all, we all have said it, we've all been there, myself included, but what does that mean? Well, what it means is that really your second finger should be halfway between the first two tapes. But I know a lot of teachers that say your first and second finger touch. Well, geographically speaking, they're close, but not exactly. So informing kids to put their fingers halfway between the tapes is a really helpful way to do this. Think if you have students with really narrow fingers, for instance, their fingers won't touch actually. There will be a tiny little gap. In my case, there's a tiny little gap between my fingers when I play the note F natural or C natural on the violin. Also it helps your cellos and basses to visualize where their second fingers go and getting that halfway between those two given tapes as well. What about double bass? 
Now, one of the biggest mistakes I see um, as I travel the country and work with different orchestras and as I see um, students from everywhere, universally, bass students, their second finger is almost always flat. Now let's think about that, all right. Let's go back to the D string, for instance, on double bass. If you have open D, first finger E, and then fourth finger F sharp, well, it makes sense that they can visualize that one and four, but where does the two go? Well, remember, one and two, there should be a big gap on double bass between your first and second finger, and then two, three, and four live all very close together, which is uh, very important for the visualization aspect for our double basses, for them to be able to see where that finger goes and consequently not play it flat. And of course, they're gonna keep the elbow up and all the good posture things that are so important to playing in tune. Once I've got every string perfectly in tune and I'm certain of it, I am double and triple checking that I've got every finger tape exactly in tune. In this case, we'll check D. And sure enough, down to the scent, it's in tune. What about extension notes? What about that dreaded C sharp on the G string for violin, viola, and cello? Oh man, I used to fear this one. And I figured out, ah, when I use these finger tapes properly and they're really in the right place, well, check it out. It helps students to be able to see again, oh yeah, okay, on the G string, my third finger goes exactly halfway between the, the third and fourth tapes. Oh, okay. Now, still gonna take more work than just that to get it in tune, but what a helpful visualization for them to go, oh, that's exactly where I put my finger. I got it. I put it there every time it's gonna be in tune if the instrument is in tune, right? And for cellos, for them to be able to see, okay, when you start teaching those extensions, remembering that the thumb goes behind the second finger in the left hand and that you're extending your fourth finger, your two, three, and four are up here. Your first finger is extended backward, however you wanna think about it but to be able to visualize, oh, my fourth finger is going halfway between um, the what would normally be the fourth finger tape and then that fourth position tape as well, that next tape. So helpful from a visualization standpoint. A really great drill when you're trying to do these extension notes. First finger, then B, then C sharp, and they can actually see, oh yes, halfway between those tapes. There it is. It's exactly in tune when I put my finger in the right spot. One of the biggest mistakes that I see is orchestra teachers trying to rush the process of D major, G major sequence, and even C major, which would be the next one that I would teach. But I spend so much time, and I would encourage you to do this too, especially in the beginning stages of orchestra, in those first few months, in the first year of playing, focus a lot on D major and G major. Really understanding where the students put their fingers and reminding them every chance you get where their fingers go and, and stopping them with love and making them put it in the right place and having them play in even one at a time, not stigmatizing it, doing it with love, but just, okay, let me hear your G, let me hear your G, oh, toward your nose a little bit, oh, away from your nose a little bit, or cello's down towards the floor a little bit, up towards the ceiling now, bass is the same thing, and making it uh, not stigmatized whatsoever, but a positive experience. But again, if you rush this beginning stage, boy, it makes it really hard down the road. And I understand, you know, you wanna get them playing as much as humanly possible, but think about the other skills you can be teaching while you're getting them to play in tune in D major and G major, um, and even C major. Well, my goodness, you can get them learning dynamics, bow lane control, where it's, I teach one, two, three, four, five, five being like almost right next to the bridge, right? Almost on it, like plenty cello. Um, you're able to master that sounding point concept, right? You're able to work on other posture concepts. You're able to work on the other fundamentals that go into music making balance and blend with your orchestras. And who do we really need to hear the strongest? Who do we need to hear softer? Understanding roles. There's so many skills you can be teaching while they're learning that D major and G major sequence. Don't rush the opening stage of where do we place fingers in D major and G major, and then eventually C major. And then I would sequence after that, more like in the second year of playing, um, the A major 
scale. And then obviously others, F major, were coming in, in, in that place where we're learning more of the abstract extensions. And again, finger tapes are gonna be huge throughout that process, but no need to rush it. There are so many other skills, musical skills, ensemble, listening skills to one another that we can be teaching at that same time. How do we play together as a group, working with a metronome, etc. Uh, counting, all of those things that are gonna help your ensemble to be absolutely fantastic and bearable to listen to because they play in tune. What about your student's posture? This is everything. Your students are not going to play well in tune if they do not have the look of a violinist, the look of a violist, the look of a cellist, the look of a double bassist. So, Spending the time making sure that their posture is set up correctly is everything. I'm gonna link below my video to teaching beginning pedagogy, beginning string pedagogy, beginning strings, uh, as a reference to you where I get really in depth about every single step that I utilize, and it's a very long video that's really detailed that can almost be used as a manual if you find it helpful. Uh, so I'm not gonna get into a ton of that right now, but suffice it to say their posture is really important. How are your violas and violins going to play in tune if they're hunched over like this and their left hand is collapsed? Well, in my case, I believe for violins, violas, a good shoulder rest, a Kuhn, K-U-N, or an Everest, E-V-E-R-E-S-T. Uh, those are really great shoulder rests. I do believe in using those. I think they're helpful, or at the very least, a sponge is extremely helpful. Uh, I, I'm not a proponent for nothing at all because you're, you're taking something that would otherwise cause a lot of fatigue, just the bare instrument by itself. Uh, and, and instead, now, by using that shoulder rest, you're making it more ergonomically comfortable. And think of your really great violinists in the world. Hilary Hahn uses one, Maxim Bingroff uses one. Uh, so many of the really amazing superstar players, they use one. And so it shouldn't be stigmatized. And, and I highly recommend that in your orchestra program. In the case of your cellists, making sure that they're uh, so in pin is set at the correct height. You wouldn't believe how often that is a huge part of the problem. Their instruments way down here because their in pin isn't high enough or they don't have it placed at that one o'clock spot. And again, link below in to, to the beginning string setup on how I do that. But having them in the right spot is so important. Your basis that you don't want the bass over tilting into them, that you want it neatly resting against their side and in the inner thigh to, to bring it in comfortably. And do you have your bass stand or sit? To each their own, there are different ways to do that, but there is a look to every instrument that is played in the class. And you know as the professional orchestra teacher what that look is. So just be relentless about that. Maybe you have pictures up on the overhead projector uh, on your computer, on your screen that you put in front of the classroom to help kids with that. But again, how are they gonna play an in-tune fourth finger on the G string, if it's a violin and viola? Um, how are they gonna do that if their instrument's way down here? Well, that's about impossible. So posture is everything, absolutely everything. And if that step isn't in place, and the strings aren't in tune, of course, but if, but if, they, if their posture isn't there, everything else that comes after is gonna be so difficult. One of the really common cello and bass problems is that the hand shape is not quite correct. The hand ultimately needs to be extremely squared up in the left hand. And notice that I have what I call rainbow fingers. I use the Pledge of Chalegiance, I bring my arm around, my fingers are nice and curved, and my thumb is curved. One of the common problems is that the thumb goes up here when we want the thumb behind the second finger, directly behind the second finger at all times. This is true when we do extensions as well, that my two, three, and four live closely together, my thumb stays behind second finger as my first finger stretches back. But when students lose the hand strength in their left hand, ultimately it causes the pitch to go flat when the fingers uh, don't have enough resistance against the thumb. And so that nice round hand shape of not crushing the coat can is really important so that we don't have extremely flat sounding pitches ultimately. This is also very much true for double bass as well in that if the hand shape collapses, or if the elbow collapses and we don't do what I call squeezing the tennis ball, same for cello, of imagining a, a ball that we're holding, we're squeezing a cello ball, then ultimately the pitch is gonna end up flat for them as well. One of the most important things we can do and should always do as string teachers is modeling for students, right? 
not only just for playing in tune, certainly, but for style, for length and placement of bow, for posture, everything. There are a million benefits to that. But for this instance, and for the purpose of this video, we're talking about playing in tune, right? So we're gonna play a, a simple D major sequence. I'm gonna model as the teacher. I might model what is correct to do and what's wrong to do, uh, making it clear which is which. But for right now, I'm modeling the proper way of playing, and I'm gonna play a sequence and have Madison echo me, okay? Ready? Echo me, please, Madison. posture so you're showing good posture all right jaw flex I call this a jaw flex no hands for a second good now bring your left hand up into playing position straight left hand good and we're moving around the room constantly checking as we're modeling <laughs> Exactly. And so again, modeling helps them to hear exactly what you're doing. They have, um, especially when you're taking one bar at a time and then echoing that, that one bar, yeah, but it helps them to hear, ah, there's an example. There it is in tune and now here I am. Here's the thing. Posture has to constantly be revisited, just like playing in tune and insisting on playing in tune has to constantly be revisited. There are all these important skills and you're constantly circling between them. So every time my students are bringing their instrument out, I'm reminding them. And by the way, that's even with my uh, winning state championship orchestra at the high school, our Indiana State Champion Orchestra. I'm still reminding them sometimes about certain posture related issues and how they contribute to better overall success. So no group ever outgrows that. And it's something we have to constantly come back to as string teachers. Singing is everything in the string world as well, and really just all of music. Not only does it help us to hear pitches, it helps us to shape phrases later. How would we sing it? How would a singer sing it? You know, would they sing twinkle, twinkle, little star? Or would they twinkle, twinkle, little star? Basic phrasing like that. It also helps in that regard. So I have my kids sing constantly and I don't stigmatize it. I even tell them, hey, I was a choir kid once upon a time. And, um, and we just, we have fun singing. Make it a fun thing that you do. Don't just make it no big deal. Um, just like it's just part of what you do every day. Have them point to the page as they're saying the note names. You can say, say the note names, but then you sing it and then they sing it as well with you. So, all right, sing it with me. We're going to, we're going to go through the, through the song together. That's a great way that you can get them matching pitch. Um, for instance, if you have kids shifting, right? You're doing a shift and you're trying to go from E to G. And maybe, maybe they keep over shifting. Have them sing that interval. E to G, sing it with me, E, G. And this is the process of what we call audiating. You're taking the music, you're making it something we can auditorily hear by singing. And it helps them to, oh, okay, all right, that helps to inform physically what they're doing. Take that simple shifting drill that we just did. How often have you had a shift that is out of tune in orchestra class? My goodness, that's all the time, right, for, for us as orchestra teachers. Well, use drones. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna put this over the loudspeaker in my orchestra room. I have the E and the G put together and Good. Hold that note. Again, we're holding softly. And now shift. Let me hear that G. Or maybe if that note is tricky, have them play it in first position for us. And then we do the shift. So that they're actually hearing the note. And they can hear instantly if they're a little bit sharp or a little bit flat. Have them hold the note. Lots of holding notes out. Let me hear the first note, let me hear the second note. And you're coding the sequence of learning and breaking it down into small chunks that way. 
drones are so helpful. And again, the Aptonal Energy for me, that's the way that I do it. So helpful to me when I'm trying to get a certain pitch and tune that they have a reference to work from. And so drones can be one of your best friends. No, it doesn't have to be just this though. You could also, um, if, you, if you have a section that's really struggling to get a passage in tune, a particular note, and you're working that note over and over and over again, and you have, say for instance, you know, maybe the cell cellos and basses are trying to get this shift in tune, and the violins and violas have it, they're just sitting there, why not have the violins and violas hold the note that they're trying to shift to, the problem note, so that they're holding it out as a drone, you're involving them rather than having them sit there. And then you can also have whatever section is listening, also critique and listen and go, oh, uh, okay, it was a little bit better. How many of you think that that note was better in tune that time? Raise your hand, great. How many of you say it was still out of tune? but a little bit better, all right? How many of you say it's perfectly in tune? Nobody yet? Okay, well, let's keep working at that. And you're involving the students that way and making them active participants in the tuning process by serving as drones and by giving feedback also to one another. And we always do it in a loving way, that's super important. And in, to, to, that, to that end, you can also have kids and should have kids maybe play for their stand partner, all right? One of you is going to play, the other person on the, uh, on the inside is going to listen and then switch off, vice versa, and have them give feedback to one another. What's one thing you liked and what's one point of suggestion you can give them, one point of loving critique that you can give them to help them improve that note being in tune and, and what exactly physically is happening. That one-on-one -on -one feedback is great and administrators love seeing that too in your classroom that students are collaborating. It's not all just coming from you, it's coming from them too. We have to make intonation, playing in tune, relevant to our students and relevant to us as directors. So how do we do that? Well, think, think, of, think of awareness, right? We've all had food stuck to the side of our face at some point and then a friend points to us, this is me almost every day, a friend is pointing to me and saying, you got a little something on your face and you look in the mirror and you go, oh my gosh, I do, how long have I been there, right? It's awareness and awareness is key, right? And so are you hearing the group that's playing in front of you or are you looking at the score and rationalizing and hearing the group in your head that you'll want to hear? I've been there. Our brains have this confirmation bias where we want to try to make everything correct in our mind or make excuses for things being off. And so we need to really respond to the group in front of us. You should record as the director the ensemble constantly and listen to it. I do this all the time, all the time. I have records of my groups going back decades. <laughs> it's painful sometimes to listen to, but it's important. It's like looking in that mirror sometimes. It's hard. So I record my students also. Speaking to the students for a second, we want them also to be aware of what they're hearing. We want the students to listen back. So I record them constantly, little bits at a time. And I've got just a common recorder app right up here. But for instance, I'm going to use the song Ode to Joy right now. I'm going to play Ode to Joy. I'm going to intentionally play it painfully out of tune, okay, as, a, as an example and of something that might have happened in your class. So here we go. Okay, so then... I stop that, right? <laughs> then I'm gonna tell the kids, all right, we're gonna listen back to this. I want you to ask yourself as you're listening, is it better than I thought it would be? Is it worse than I thought it would be? Is it exactly what I thought it would be? And by the way, you should ask yourself this too as you listen to your own orchestras. Okay, so and then I'm gonna play that back. Maybe I go to the piano as a reference or maybe I play it on my instrument, the correct pitches. So check it out. Here we go. Pardon me, I'm gonna step over here. going to make it really relevant. Come on, anybody can hear that, right? <laughs> and so they listen back to it and they go, oh, I see what you mean. Or they listen to the group being um, not quite perfectly in tune together, or it, this can be applied certainly to other skills, rhythm, etc., dynamics, you name it, any part of music, any part of music. But especially for pitch, this awareness factor is huge. And I use it all the time because remember, 
you might care so much, but do the kids care? Do they need to care as much or more than you do about playing it in tune? And this is how you get one of the ways that you can get buy-in to build that awareness. Recording often, all the time. And then record again the correct way. And you can react to the different ways. All right, let's listen to the first way we played this. Now let's listen to the last way that we played it. All right, how many of you think we improved? Oh, great, okay, all right, right? And, and they are gonna hear that improvement in real time. They have buy-in and they go, oh, I see why he or she was being tough on me about that. Got it, okay, now we're getting it, now we sound good. And remind them, always do it from a place of love. Remind them that you care, that you get paid the same regardless of if that note's in tune, <laughs> but that you love them and you care and you wanna help them be the best that they possibly can be. So to simulate the group experience, I have my wife, Madison Powell here. Uh, of Play Violin YouTube channel. Uh, link in the description. She has a wonderful music education violin channel. That's awesome. But we're gonna simulate the orchestra experience and we're gonna record us playing a really painful Ode to Joy experience. Ready? I will play out of tune. She will play beautifully in tune. Perfect. So obviously you hear that that's out of tune, but for our students, we want them to listen back and we want them to listen in the context. We're gonna tell them what to listen for. Okay, I want you to listen for the tuning. Is it, is the intonation, and again, we're explaining what that word means, the playing in tune, ability to play in tune. Is our intonation spot on? Is it better than you thought it would be? Is it worse than you thought it would be? Or is it the same that you thought it would be? And so let's listen. And then we're gonna take a vote. We know the open Ds are in tune. And that, so obviously then I'll take the poll and I will ask him, all right, what is the one note that was in tune? Oh, well, it was open D. Oh yeah, okay, so what that means then is the problem ain't the instrument, it's you putting your finger in the right spot. And this is a step to awareness. Now, this is also where I start to introduce the concepts of levels of listening. Level one is listening to yourself. Your kids are getting pretty good at that. They might go, well, I put the right finger down at the right time. I mean, how often do you experience that too? You teach privately. Yeah. You see that all the time, right? And they might say, well, I'm putting the finger down. And yeah, but it's not quite in the right place. You know, we're not quite agreeing. And so again, when you can use those tapes back to, you know, using tapes as a reference tool, if you can say, okay, but are you landing on the tapes and are you matching then your neighbor? Your level of listening can't just be level one yourself. What about your group right by you? All right, in this case, it's my wife. <laughs> and so we can hear, oh yeah, I'm hearing that's out of tune. You can have them play in smaller groups for that, but you might say, okay, just this pocket, just this pod is gonna play, just this pod now, just this pod of people. And we don't stigmatize it, we encourage them and say, hey, great job, great bow hold, you know, all this is looking great. But what about the tuning? Okay, well, let's work on it. And then obviously level three listening is listening to the entire ensemble to make sure we all agree and that we're all matching and in tune and, and changing our bow at the same time together. Those levels of listening really come in handy when we're analyzing recordings and we're using that as a tool to improve. So now we're ready to try it again. We're gonna give them another shot. We're gonna have them listen to it because our goal is to get this in tune, obviously. So let's record it again and hopefully we'll be better in tune. We listen back then, I would ask them the same question. Think, is it better, worse, same as you thought it would be? Let's give it a listen. Pretty good, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And when your string players are trained to tune something, I had one note where I added vibrato. Have them play without vibrato. That seems like an obvious thing, but I see that mistake all the time in orchestra classrooms. Yeah. So obviously then they can hear that, oh, okay, that's way better. And then 
it might take, obviously it's not gonna be perfect probably by the second time, right? But you go through this process of trying to get it better, go to the time before that then and go, look how it did sound, right? This is what it did sound like. Yikes. And again, by the time that you guys got done with this, listen to how in tune it was. It was so much better, we finally got it. Oh, buy-in, then they get it, they get it. Ah, this is a part, this is something I can control. I'm better at that now, all right, cool. I can hear it, and it's, relative, it's relevant then to them. One of the other tools that we can use is drones when we're trying to get kids to play in tune. And again, an app, a good app, goes a long way in helping to get the kids in tune. Tonal energy is great for that. Say this note is out of tune. I'm gonna have Madison here hold that note, okay? Madison, would you play it a little out of tune on purpose, please? Okay, good, freeze for just a second. You're getting closer, so I would tell the student. Now, let's aim a little bit toward our nose. Let's get toward our nose, and let's make sure our left hand's nice and straight. We're holding the violin up. Again, we're focusing on posture, which she's already doing nicely, but ready? So hold it again, still be a little flat for me. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> it's really close. Adjust, take a guess, see if it, you're getting better. Go a little too far. Now they'll sometimes overcompensate. Oh, you're on the right track, come back. Away from your nose. And again, away from your nose and toward your nose helps. One way that might help her, thank you, to be able to get that better in tune is also to hold other notes with that drone. I might hold like a perfect fourth. So let's play it again. Play it a little flat again. Now move it to being in tune. Toward your nose, toward your nose, good. And just for the sake of what might happen in class, go a little too far again. You can hear it, and then, listen. Here comes the bride, a little lower, away from your nose. You might even put in a lower G, a lower octave G, which would come across better in a big sound system. Great, thank you. And so using that intervallic tool really helps for kids to be able to hear. Oh, with the drone, I'm also using different intervals. It helps them to, to be able to hear the slight adjustments that they need to be able to make when they're hearing other harmonies. Using a really well-tuned piano or a keyboard, electric keyboard is extremely helpful. You don't wanna be chained to a piano, obviously when you're teaching orchestra class, but it's a really helpful tool. It's another tool, another trick in your bag that you can use, and it helps kids to hear when they're in tune or out of tune. And so for instance, Madison, let's hold that G. Now we'll pretend that the students as a kind of a group are just a little bit too low on that note, okay? So go ahead and hold that G go. Okay, and I might break it down, then I might have just small groups, small pods play for me, or I might hear it one by one in a non-judgmental way, in a loving way. Hey, you're doing great. I just want to hear where this note is. Let's go ahead and we're going to help you make an adjustment. Always do it with love. So Madison, can I hear just you play that note? And then I'm going to change the chords. You don't have to be a great piano player to do this, but I'm going to change the chords subtly underneath this. So I could play a G chord since it's G. Okay, a little bit towards your nose. And I'm doing that so that they're hearing other subtle tonality changes underneath, other um, harmonic changes underneath to help them, help inform them, oh, just to hear how that G fits in. It's kind of like when you look at the big picture of a puzzle and you see kind of the shape that you need and you're trying to fit that puzzle piece in the right spot and get it into the right location. So subtly changing the tonalities also helps, but again, using the piano as a helpful tool is great for kids to be able to hear. Obviously, the focus of this video is about how to get your orchestras to play in tune, but certainly a piano can be helpful in just establishing pulse, not letting pizzicato rush in those early stages. Uh, it can help your very advanced orchestras. Like, for instance, Ode to Joy, just for the pacing and for the intonation, we'll play this now uh, together. And Madison, we play it just a little out of tune, okay? Intentionally. <laughs> she has a degree, she knows how to play it in tune, right? as well as any of us. <laughs> Ready, and... That's 
really close. Let's hold that first note. Would you hold that first note? Same thing again, okay? Now you got that first note. Hold that first note again. Class, I might say this to the whole orchestra. Hold it together. Listen to your neighbor again. Levels of listening. Match your neighbor to make sure your F sharp's on in tune. Also, sing it with me once. Let's sing it. Uh, I won't make her sing, but we would sing that note together. Okay. And we're checking every single every single way that we've talked about. All right. Now look at your tape. Are you landing right on the tape? She doesn't have them on this instrument. She's a professional, but our students certainly would. All right, so let's hold that first note again. Good orchestra adjust. Make sure it's right on the tape. Double check. Look at the tape. Are you smack dab on the center of the tape? Good. Next note, G. Listen to your neighbor. Are you matching your neighbor? Good. And up to A, fourth finger. Big stretch. Bring your elbow under the violin. Good. Back down to G. Good. It's close. A little higher. Sharp, a little higher toward your nose. Great, and E for finger. Softly, change your bow as little as possible. Softly, good, and back to D. And again, we're playing it softly. Good. Now let's play it again, Madison. Very good. Take a mental snapshot of where that F sharp was, where you started. That was great. compliment him. Nice job. Maybe we would be recording that process as well so that we could hear those differences. Again, using all the tricks that we possibly can. But the piano, again, is such a helpful tool. Um, and just make sure you have one that gets the volume way up, especially if it's a really big class that you have. It's going to be important for them to be able to hear. One other really important skill is to predict, not react. We want to teach kids to predict. What is our tendency? Um, on particular notes, do we are we going to be too high or too low? And in that vein, hearing the note before you play it, obviously with a reference. <laughs> if if we want them to go up to a G, like for instance, if they're shifting from first position to third position in violin and violas cases, or this could be certainly for cello and bass as well. What does the G sound like? E. You could have them sing it again. Back to that singing concept. E. G, so I'm gonna predict where my hand needs to move. I'm gonna take my thumb with me also when I shift, very important with shifting. Students will tend to be flat for that reason, they don't take their thumb with them enough. Ah, uh, good, check it against your open G. Use open strings as much as possible as references as well. So I'm predicting, not reacting. Oh, 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 now I gotta get it lower. Okay, let's, now this time let's predict. All right, I overshot, so I'm going to, I'm gonna hear that note. G, E, G, okay. Do, me. Last and most importantly, none of these other steps matter. Unless <laughs> you are insanely picky about students playing in tune, unless you are making it relevant to them. Here's the thing, you never stop working on intonation. I don't know about you, I've been doing this for decades playing my instrument, my wife too, and um, so many of, of you, I'm confident it's the same situation. We've been doing this our entire lives. We never stop working on our intonation. It's always a work in progress. I always like to tell students, intonation is kind of like uh, body odor. We have to assume it's us and we gotta wear the deodorant. <laughs> and it's true for playing in tune as well. We're constantly working on it, whether we have tapes or not, whether we're advanced and, and we're, you know, the tippy top, one of the tippy top groups in the country, in the state, in the world, or whether we're beginning orchestra and we're working on Dragon Hunter trying to get the notes in tune, it doesn't matter. We're constantly working on intonation. You have to be insanely picky with your groups about being in tune. So find new ways to make it relevant to them. All of these tricks work really well. But if you aren't constantly cycling back through all the things, all right, posture, all right, good rhythm, all right, good intonation, really getting the finger on the tape and using those tools we talked about, if you're not making it relevant to them, none of it will matter. And so you're gonna feel like you're beating a dead horse sometimes, but you gotta keep doing it. And it's not being mean. 
It's not being mean to the kids. Do it in a loving, fun, joyful way. That's the, the art part of teaching is, uh, for me, it's a whole lot of humor and a whole lot of laughter and a whole lot of joy. Learning should be fun. And I'm sure for you, I'm sure you do the same and you've got your own process, but make it relevant to the students and don't let intonation go. Find new ways to make it relevant and matter to them and keep insisting upon it from the very beginning level all the way through their entire playing experience. And by doing this, I can assure you, it is possible to have orchestra students, string students play in tune. I hope this has been helpful to you. My goal is not to give you the only way to do it, not at all. There are so many great teachers out there and so many great ways to do it. This is just my way of doing it. Are there other things you can do on top of this? Absolutely, but these are the most important and most pivotal things that I consider when I'm teaching this challenging skill of intonation. I encourage you, if you have any questions whatsoever, I have a link to my website below, joelpowellconductor.com, J-O-E-L-P-O-W-E-L-L, conductor.com. Reach out to me anytime. Uh, I offer mentoring sessions. I offer professional development. I do a lot of conducting all around the country. And one thing's for certain, we can teach our kids to play in tune and we can do it with love and joy. And what a gift it is to teach kids. You teach kids. Thank you for doing that. And keep spreading the love uh, for music through what you do. Thank you so much and best wishes to you.